السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وشر ولا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخرق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما إما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهج حج محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشر المول محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم إما بعد Indeed our praise belong to Allah We lord him We seek his aid And we ask his forgiveness We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of our own selves And from the evils of our own actions Whomsoever it is that Allah has guided There is none that can misguide him and whomsoever it is that Allah has misguided, there is none that can guide him. I testify that there is none worthy of worship in truth except for Allah, alone without any partner. And I testify that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger. O you who possess faith, have piety of Allah, whilst giving him his due right of that piety. And do not allow death to reach you, except that you are in a state of Islam, as Muslims, O humanity, have piety of your Lord, who has created you from a single soul. And from that single soul, 
he has brought forth his wife. And from that single soul and from that wife, they have brought forth humanity in multitude. And have piety of Allah, to whom you demand your mutual rights of kith and kin and other than it. And do not cut off ties of kith and kin, for indeed Allah is ever an observer over you all. O you who possess faith, have piety of Allah and say a word that is correct. In exchange, Allah will rectify your affairs for you. He will forgive you of your sins. And whomsoever it is that has obeyed Allah and his messenger has already achieved the greatest of achievements to proceed. Certainly the best speech is the book of Allah. And the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the most evil of affairs are newly invented novelties within faith. For every newly invented novelty within faith is an innovation within faith. And all innovation within faith is misguidance. And the ultimate result of misguidance is the fire of hell. Again to proceed. As we ever so swiftly approach the month of Dhul-Hijjah, approach the month that contains Hajj, that contains the fifth pillar of Islam that we call Hajj, the major pilgrimage, we should also remain reflective that this month, this month of Dhul-Hijjah, this month of Hajj, it is the month of Abu al-Anbiya. It is the month of the father of the prophets. It is the month of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So as it is a month that he is being commemorated, we should spend time looking into his life during this month and reflecting on his contributions and how he was guided and how he attained victory. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he is a prophet. Ibrahim alayhi salam is amongst those who have reached the highest level of prophethood that we call messengership. Ibrahim alayhi salam is amongst those who have received messengership. He is an elite amongst them. And he is one of five. For the prophets are 124,000. The messengers are 315, and Ulul Azam, the firmly willed prophets, are only five. Ibrahim alayhi salam is amongst the best of all of humanity. He is the crim de la grim. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he lived, as historians mentioned, for 169 years. 169. There are others that mention he lived to 175. And yet still others that mentioned he lived to 195. Ibrahim alayhi salam, his father is Azur, Ibn Nahur. And he was born in a city called Ur, Ur of the Chaldea. It is more familiar to us by Babylonia or Babylon. And if all of that sounds murky to us, just think ancient Persia. And if that's still murky, think about Iran and Iraq. This is the area where Ibrahim is from, Ali Hassan. He's born into this family. And his father had an occupation. His father was a, a sculptor. And his father, he was one that sculpted out idols. And he would sculpt out idols for the people of his nation. And he was at the highest level of doing that. He was the guy. He was the guy when it came to sculpting and making these idols that their people worship. So as Ibrahim alayhi salam is growing up as a child, he sees what his father is doing as children are. He becomes inquisitive and he asks his father what he's doing and why he's doing it. So he tells them that these are the idols that are representative of the gods that we worship for us and our people. And they worship the stars in a particular fashion, and the moon in a particular fashion, and the sun in a particular fashion, thus and so. So this is the environment that he grows up in. He grows up in an environment of idolatry, 
which is interesting because the lineage of Ibrahim as his father is Azar and his grandfather is now Hur, if you trace the lineage back, it goes directly back to Nuh because all prophets and messengers share the same bloodline. You cannot be a prophet and messenger without being in the bloodline of prophethood and messengership. And we know the mission of Nuh and we know why those people were destroyed. So then, after the shirk that was committed by the people of Nuh and Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala washing out those people by flooding the entire area, if not the entire earth. And then humanity being repopulated this time, specifically through the lineage of Nuh alayhi salam, because the rest of humanity was, was wiped out. We find by the time that we get to the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, our species is back at it again. We're back into the shirk game. Not only that, in interesting manifestations of shirk, not just idolatry, what we call black magic, what we call entering into contracts with the jinn and exchanging our soul for favors from them, a lot of that is based here, in this place, in this time, in Babylon. Ibrahim salam, is growing up in that environment where black magic and dealing with the jinn in exchange of souls for favors is the norm. The king of the day is an individual by the name of Nimrud or Nimrod. And he's known to be very intelligent and very powerful, but he's not known to be a, a, a righteous individual. And he was one that was, was stoked inside of this black magic and idolatry and such. And there are some in our day and time that would refer to him as a 36th degree Freemason. Nimrod, check it out. In any regard, we stand all this so that we can understand being by. So as Ibrahim salam grows up further, his fitrah is not settled with it. So he begins asking questions as to why. Why is this going on? He couldn't accept it. Why don't you just worship the creator directly? Why are you going through these idols to get to your Lord? Didn't make sense to me. And as it is the case, we find reasons to part. So once a year, there was a great festival that they would have in the name of their, their deities, in the name of their gods. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, being an intelligent person, as he is a prophet and messenger of Allah, and he came from good stock, his father was a highly intelligent individual, I'm going to prove something to my people. He's young at the time. And sometimes, being young, we don't realize that intelligence is not enough. Nevertheless, he wants to prove a point. Everybody goes out for this festival. Everybody's expected to be there on this holiday. He waits for them all to go out. And while they're all out, he goes into his father's sculpting shop and he starts breaking all the idols up. But he leaves one. He leaves the largest of the idols. He takes an axe and he places the axe in the hand of the larger idol. So after the festival, his father realizes what happened. What has happened? The people realize what happened. And they also realize the only one that could have done this was Ibrahim alayhi salam because he gave an excuse as to why he couldn't come out to this festival. He said he wasn't feeling well. So I, I can't go out this time. He didn't want to be shirked out with them. So he made an excuse. Sick. Sorry. So it got to be him. All the rest of us were over here. So when they go and question him, he enters into some polemics with them, some intellectual debate. And uh, who did this? You did this? No, no, no. That idol right there that has the axe in his hand, the idol, that, that's the idol that did it, the biggest of them all. He did this. You know what can't talk? 
You know what can't move? Oh, so then why are you worshiping it then? Right? They didn't like that too much. The matter and the fame of Ibrahim alayhi salam spreads throughout the land. And while we would call it fame, at that time they would call it infamous. It reaches Nimrud. It reaches Nimrod. Now, this is like the president of the United States calling in to talk to you personally. He's the king. He shows up. They have a debate. And uh, in their debate, Ibrahim salam is telling him about Iman, telling him about faith, telling him about what we now call Aqidah, what we now call proper theology. It's Allah who controls life and death. Nimrod says, okay, is that right? Okay, bring so-and-so and so-and-so -so here. He came, he kills him. You see that? I control life and death. Ibrahim says, no problem. Look, uh, you, see, you see that thing up in the sky? You, you, you see that sun? And you see how when it rises, it rises from the east? Make it rise from the west. Because that's what my Lord does. You go do that. Right? So he had to succumb. Although he didn't believe. They didn't like it. We're not going to win intellectually with this guy. And we don't want him causing problems in our society. We definitely don't want Amos believing like he's believing. We got to get rid of him. So they come up with this grand scheme. We're going to start collecting a whole bunch of things that burn. Whatever you got. You got wood. You got this. You got that. Everybody from the city starts bringing whatever they got that can burn. And as the book states, they built the largest bonfire that any of them had ever seen at that time. Then they go get a catapult. Then they get it, but on him, because they had captured him and they bring him in chains and all this type of thing. He's in the catapult, can't get away. They launch him, hurl him into the fire. Now, Ibrahim alayhi salam, as is his story, we're going to see throughout much of his life, he was alone. He didn't have too many people around him. He had to stand on his own too by himself for much. So he was an individual that embodied the meaning of tawakkul, that embodied personify the meaning of placing one's trust and reliance upon Allah. He is a prophet and a messenger of Allah. He is one that if he's going to make, if he makes dua to Allah, Allah responds to him. He is Khalil Allah. He's the friend of Allah. Yes, no? He gets catapulted. He's in the sky, in the air, getting catapulted into this fire. Jibreel alayhi salam descends while he's in midair. Uh, you need some help here? My Lord is sufficient for me. I don't need anything from you. An angel descends from Allah for you to help you? What you gonna say? You gonna say yes and yes and yes right now. Ibrahim alayhi salam, my Lord is sufficient. I don't need you for this. He enters into the fire. Due to the level of the man, the level of his trust, his belief in Allah, he enters into this fire knowing that his Lord is the Lord of the fire and the Lord of these people and everything that's going on. He knows what he is doing is true and right. So he is ready and submits to whatever Allah has decreed for. Allah then makes the fire cool for Ibrahim. It doesn't burn. Fire is there. He's in it. But it's not affecting him. Furthermore, there are actually narrations that indicate that within this fire, it wasn't just fire, but rather while it was fire that the people saw inside of the fire, they saw what looked like the what looked like a garden. So not only did Allah make it cool for Ibrahim, He made it like a garden for him. So he's in there chilling. There's another narration that mentions that he had been in there for so long, and his mother 
was so sad and yearning for him that she wanted to see, touch her son, make sure he's okay. They all see him in there. He ain't coming out. Now, this is what he did use his dua out for. He asked Allah to ta'ala to allow his mother to visit with him for a short period. When he made that dua, the fire parted in such a way that his mother was able to enter into for a period and be with him inside of that garden inside of the fire. These are all miracles and evidences against the people and all what they're doing. They still don't believe it. Well, she exits out of the fire. They keep it going as the narration of state for 40 days, which is indicative of a long period of time. Just like some of us may say, well, how long did it take? Well, it took a month. Doesn't necessarily mean a month exactly, right? This is when you hear the term 40 days, right? Around about time. He gets out. Well, that's all I can do for y'all. It's time for me to go. He migrates. He leaves. It's just him, his wife, Sarah, who was his cousin, and another messenger by the name of Lut or Lot, that was either his nephew or his cousin. Three of them set out. They're setting out now to convey the message of Allah. The story of Lut, alayhi salam, well, for me, with that story, that's a story that is uh, very pertinent today. Him and Sarah, they go on a tour of the known world at that time. They end up, they stop in Egypt. And they go to Palestine, and, and they're moving around to establish some things. And they're doing this by themselves, going to places where they are not known. So I share these words of mine. And I say forgiveness myself as well as for you all. So seek his forgiveness. Certainly is all forgiving, most merciful. الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده إما بعد. So Ibrahim عليه السلام and his wife Sarah they end up in northeastern Africa. They end up there. They're in the area or the region that we call ancient Kemet. We don't want to say Egypt because then you're going to think the geography was limited to that country. It's not. It wasn't limited like that in that time. It's larger than. So in any regard, they're there. And Sarah was a very, she was a very attractive woman. So the king of the land hears about Sarah and uh, calls for her. These people from out of town, they're here and what's going on with them. She's a beautiful woman. I think I want this for myself. I want to have this foreign woman for myself, different from what we got around here. He calls for her. She has to come. Ibrahim doesn't want it to be worse. He said, if they ask, just say that you're my sister, meaning sister in me. She comes. He attempts to have his way with her, wasn't working for him. He extends his hand into her hand, into her hand. She takes it, and then Allah made it so that in her grip of her hand, Either the grip was too strong for him, or by way of that shake, Allah caused his body to contort and weaken and, be, and become painful. Happens once he falls to the ground. But he's focused. He will not give up. Second time, same thing. Third time, same thing. Get this woman away from me and away from here. As a matter of fact, I got a gift for you. Take this and go. What was the gift? Well, that gift, if you want to call it that, was our mother Hajar, Hagar. And she was one of the slaves of the king in Africa at that time. She is gifted to Sarah. Sarah then says, no, she's for you, Ibrahim. Ibrahim frees her and marries her. They then go up 
to the Levantine region, to the area of Palestine, there in this space. And uh, Sarah couldn't have children, at least not to that point. But Heja, she became pregnant very quickly with Ismail alayhi <coughs> salam. And uh, men are men and women are women and Sarah couldn't hack it. You got to take it away from me. I can't do it. So then Ibrahim leads from now the Levantine region from Palestine. He goes out with his second wife, Hajar Hagar, to this barren desert. And all this is being ordered by Allah as he's moving through. He's in the middle of nowhere. And in this barren desert, he then eventually receives order that he now has to go back to his other wife in Palestine and deal with matters there. And he don't say much. He just following commandments. He gets up. He just goes. Hedger says to him, is it Allah that has ordered you with this? He says, yes, Allah ordered me with this. Then Allah is sufficient for me and for us. They didn't even have nothing. Wasn't a whole lot of food there. Wasn't no, it's a desert with water there. Wasn't no people there like that. Law is sufficient. If that's what he ordered you with, we're going to be taken care of. He leaves. She's there with Ismail, who was a, a fairly newborn child at the time. Long story short, wish we had more time. But through this event of Hajar searching to and fro for provisions for her and her child, when the little bit of date and water that they had ran out, she runs between these two mountains that we now call Safa and Marwa. And then the angel Jibreel salam descends, striking the ground with the tip of his wing. And the at that point, the river of Zamzam begins flowing from it. Which Zamzam means stop, stop. Because of how much was flowing when it was just nothing there. And then due to her taking her hands and taking it from the water, it remains as, as a spring and no longer as the river that it started as. And at that time, the search for vegetation and hydration was real. So once there was a body of water here, other people came out and searched for that. And the Arab came up from Yemen because that's where the Arab had remained at that time. They were down in Yemen. And they knew how to track and things like that. You look for birds in the sky. Where are they settling out? Because they're going to settle around some water somewhere. They find it. By way of that, the people that we call the Arab today and the place that we call Mecca today, that was the start of that. Ismail alayhi salam marries into the Arab that were from Yemen and now we have this mixed Arab that from that lineage, eventually we get the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Up in, uh, in the Levantine region where Sarah is, she has a son after that, Ishaq. Ishaq, prophet and messenger like Ismail is. Ishaq has a son, Ya'qub. Ya'qub has 12 sons, from them prophet Yusuf and, and, and Benjamin and, and the other 10, total 12. You get the 10 tribes of the children of Israel there. And from the children of Israel, you get all these prophets. You have Musa, and you got Harun, and you got uh, Dawood and Suleiman, and going all the way through Isa, alayhi salam, who's the last of their line. And in this place called Mecca, uh, him and Ismail, Ibrahim and Ismail, because he's got to go back and forth, he's got two families, and he's building two communities, two nations, as it were. They get together, they build the Kaaba. Not that many people did. They get together. They start doing the ritual rites of Hajj. They get together. Then Allah orders him after he's doing all this by himself and alone. And he's gotten this far. And he has established the beginning of two nations that he never got to see the fruits of it in the development of it himself. But he promised, he, he believed in the promise of his Lord. After all of that, then Allah ordered him, okay, now sacrifice yourself. 
which is tough. Can you imagine cutting the throat of your child? That's what he was ordered to do. Had to do it. Ismail, I'm patient. This is what Allah ordered, I'm patient with it. They go through with it, Allah replaces it with the rare. We're stating all this to say. When we are thinking about Hajj and the ritual rites of Hajj, and we're thinking about being at the Kaaba, we're thinking about drinking from the well of Zamzam, we're thinking about Sa'i between Safa and Marwa, we're thinking about the Hedi, the offering the, the sacrifice of, of animal for the sake of our Lord. All of this goes back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And all prophets and messengers after Ibrahim are directly from his lineage, and this is why he is Abu al-Anbiya. We state all this just to simply say that when we're in the month of Dhul-Hijjah, we should be reflective of Ibrahim alayhi salam in his life. Allah honored Ibrahim by way of this month, the month of Hajj, by making the first 10 days of this month the most valuable 10 days in all of the year. So then during this time, because we are in commemoration of Ibrahim alayhi salam, we take this time to strive to be the best that we can be, even if we are alone by ourselves, as Ibrahim was in so many scenarios, we know that our Lord is with us. But... Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Shadu an la ilaha illallah, Shadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, Hayya ala salah, Hayya al-Falah, Qad qamati salah, Qad qamati salah, 